Hello, readers. Welcome to 20 Questions with Your Favorite Author, where we ask authors important questions like why would you agree to be on this podcast? I'm Kelly Lynn Colby, Editorial Director at Curse Dragon Ship Publishing. Our guest this week is Benjamin Wallace, writer of humor and science fiction, sometimes at the same time. Ben is the best-selling author of several series, including The Duck and Cover Adventures, Dads vs. Shattered Alliance Junkers, and The Bulletproof Adventures of Damian Stockwell. He lives in Dallas, Texas, where he complains about the heat a lot. Oh, thank you, Ryan. <laughs> Yay! Welcome! Welcome, Ben! So... You know, for a man who writes stunningly interesting lineup of books, um, your bio deserves a bit more love. I think you need a little more character <laughs> in it. Like, I always start my questions with the last line of the bio. So mm -hmm. um, I guess we're talking about the weather. So is that hot enough for you? You know, I've actually been really good this year about not complaining about the heat in the summer. But I have told my wife I will not stop complaining about the summer heat in the fall. <laughs> the last couple of weeks have been miserable. Um, today was nice, finally. Um, I think you guys are in Texas too, right? So you've yeah, been we're in Houston, dealing with yep. it. As, oh, so it's, mm -hmm. yeah, it's even mm -hmm. worse down there, probably. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I've gotten better over the years, but uh, this year I've, I've, I was good through the summer, but it just went on a little, a little too long. You're like, that's it. I can't take it any longer. I need my fall. Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> well, then yeah. you were in the wrong part of the state. Uh, yeah, this year for sure. Yes, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's it's not going to work. Um, so when the heat is just too much and you can't take it, how do you like to cool off? I do hide inside. Um, I, I do write during the day, the heat of the day, mm -hmm. kind of get out to the lake maybe in the evening. Um, we're not too far from a, a lake here. So it's uh, you got a couple kayaks we'll throw in there and paddle around for a little bit. So it's it's been pretty good. But even this summer was a little even too hot for the lake, I think. I'm afraid it was uh, Mm -hmm. Pretty brutal one. So, yeah, I was going to say that I, I'd love to canoe, but I find mm -hmm. it not soothing. Like it's too hot. You know, you're in that canoe and you are mm. cooking. So is it cooler in a kayak? Am I just doing the wrong thing? Yes. It's it's also a lot easier to get it to the shoreline. There's so much lighter. And there, yes, uh, we also do, uh, you know, the summer vacations, we'll throw them in the back of the truck, take them up to Oklahoma or mm -hmm. wherever. They're easy to transport. So, yeah, I do enjoy it. It's fun. It's um, It's also, there's only room for one person. So the kids can't come unless you invite them along in their their own way. So it is a uh, it is some solitude, it is uh -huh. peace and quiet. It is nice. Uh -huh. um, yeah, if Take you get out you early early it. enough or late enough in the evening, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I've got I've got three, so uh, mm. twins. So yeah, no, getting away was part of it. <laughs> That's part of the big reason I bought it to begin with. That's right. I yeah. love you guys. Uh, I'm gonna go kayaking. Yeah. Bye. <laughs> yeah. Hey. Separation does make the heart grow fonder when it's children, 100%. Yeah. Um, I will say that I adore humor in books. It, it's You see it so rarely. And it seems so effortless when you do it. Now, I'm a writer. I understand it isn't. But that's how it reads. So that's brilliant. And I love that you have done that. I'm wondering, when did you realize humor was your core voice? And did you decide just to claim it? Um, I've always wanted to write. And I think, um, uh, one of the, the first books I think that, uh, made me realize it could be something I wanted to do was, uh, it was Steve Martin's The Cruel Shoes. And I read it probably yeah. when I was other side of 10, I was probably nine or something like that. Mm -hmm. And it was that realization, oh wait, books can be funny. They don't just have to be what school makes us read that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And, um, I've just always been a fan of stand up comedy movies, just everything. I, my dad collected old radio shows when I was growing up. So I grew up listening to like the Bickersons and Abbott and Costello mm -hmm. and all the, as much as even like the old Ray, Ray Bradbury teleplays and stuff like that. It was a lot of the, a lot of the old, basically was vaudeville comedy just taken to the radio. Right. So, right. um, it's just been pumped into me my entire life. So I just, I couldn't write something, uh, I think it's an interesting way to do the genres I really enjoy and still make them distinct. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you get into space opera, stuff like that, it's a well-explored territory and uh, the humor. And even with humor, there's been a lot of space opera humor, but um, it gives it its own distinct voice if you, you start playing with it a certain way. So it's a way to way to stand out a little bit in genres I just I want to play in anyway, like post-apocalyptic or zombies or whatever, mm -hmm. um, without feeling like I'm really retreading you know, trodden ground. So, well, I love it. I I much appreciated it. So the 
I always say that when I try to write something straight or contemporary, a dragon just pops in. Like, I can't help it. The, mm -hmm. There's, It's going to be fantasy. Even if I try to leave magic out, it pops up anyways. Does that happen with you with humor? Like, do you try to write something straight, but it just, it doesn't matter that the that's, voice just comes out? That's where I know the joke. Yeah, I'll be writing something straight. I'll, it's because my stuff's very action heavy and heavy as well. And I treat the I treat the action and adventure with, with realistic weight. Like, it's not um, slide whistles and stuff like that. But every time I feel like I'm getting, um, I feel like if, if it gets to a point where like, well, if I was reading this, I'd be making fun of it by now. I know that's where a joke is supposed to go. Um, so it's a, it's kind of a way to break the tension and even, um, it, you know, it makes the action that much harder hitting sometimes. It makes the sad parts that much sadder. But uh, yeah, I'll be writing a place and just feels like, okay, I've been serious for too long. Something goes here. Something happens here. And even in my rough outlines, I'll just write joke goes here and come back to it later you know just later. like it feel it feels like this is a beat this is where a joke goes and all right joke goes here and then on the second draft i'll figure out what that joke's supposed to be oh that's wonderful maybe that's why it doesn't feel forced because you know it'll come to yeah. me later yeah so, yeah does that mean because like you know we're professional writers so you write because you have to write and you have deadlines so do you ever feel like because of the humor do you have to depend more on your muse or are you able still just to make it happen it's it, in the, the the humor comes a little more easily to me than the rest of the story. Uh, the mm, humor and the gotcha. dialogue. I, mm -hmm. I I don't know why those those come in the first draft a lot. Of, it's like I'll, I'll put a note in if I need to, but those really seem to kind of fall out of what I'm doing. And the dialogue comes pretty easy. It's just I, I'd like to say everything I write's pretty flippant. When I get into it, though, I look at it. And I'm like, well, maybe I did have something more to say than I thought I did. So when I go to the next book, I want to make sure it's just as impactful, especially if it's in an existing series. Right. I want to make sure it's not just throwing something away on another on another episode. Some of them are very much designed to be episodic and fun like that, but some of them are, I guess, have grown to be a little more impactful as people have, uh, you know, taken to them. I think really bonded I think with they, the characters. Yep. Oh yeah, that's mm -hmm. I made that mistake once. Uh, <laughs> oh no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, that was rough. <laughs> I've never gotten a nasty email about a bad joke or an inappropriate joke, but man, you don't mess with the characters they like. They will let you know. So yeah, that was, that was, that was a rough year. <laughs> so. Oh my gosh. You're like, I didn't realize that's when you realize people really are reading it. You know, you can well, even look at the sales, you can look at the reviews, but when somebody sends you an email about it, you're like, Oh, they're really reading this stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They were some colorful emails too. They were. Fun. Oh, you're like responsibility yeah. shoulders. Yeah. So well, I knew I knew they cared. That's for sure. I mean, yes. it, obviously, it it it, uh, it moved them. <laughs> so yeah, and it moved them right to be blocked. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you care so much. Uh, I got to go over here now. Did you go kayaking? Yeah, well, you know, I hid for a while. Um, yeah. But that's I think that may be part of that that too. If I am writing humor, something mm -hmm. that tragic that happens may hit. Like I say, it hits a little harder sometimes. So. I don't know if they just didn't expect anything bad to happen in the apocalypse. It's the end of the world. Horrible things are going on all over the place. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it was it was an interesting uh, it was an interesting response to things. Interesting exchange. <laughs> yeah. Well, so now we've talked about kind of what you do. Um, how long did it take you to write your first book? Uh, the first book, um, I, I, almost every book, when I sit down and kind of eliminate the hemming and hawing, it was probably it's probably about three months. Um, but I thought about, uh, the first book I published was post-apocalyptic nomadic warriors. I thought about that book for a little Oh, that was years. your first book. It's really good. That was the, the first book I, I put out. The first book I wrote was called Tortuga's Rising. And it was very much, um, it's funny. People find that a little later cause I don't push it as hard. And, mm -hmm. uh, some people find like, wow, he's finally hit his stride. I'm like, no, that's the one I really no, didn't know what I was doing. Line. Yeah. <laughs> It was very much a Clive Cussler kind of adventure, but I had the mm -hmm. protagonists were completely ill prepared to be heroes of any kind. So, um, and that was kind of before before Kindle. And then uh, when Kindle came along, I was like, well, I'll, I'll sit on that one because it's a little more traditional, and I'll just throw this out there and see if I can find an audience for this insane post apocalyptic thing I've been thinking about forever. So, yeah, I put it together in about three months. Now, my day job at the time was copywriting um, and advertising, so I've got a writing background, and maybe that was. Or, and part of that was I really wanted to write it that, that um, it was just for me. You know, everything I've written before in that point has been, you know, poured over by 100 people and their maids and their daughters and someone who had a friend that also had somebody that looked at this. And uh, uh. so this was just like, I'm putting this out there 
I'm going to put my name on it and we'll see if um, I'm right or not was basically the test. So it, it thankfully it worked and it found an audience. So it was, it was probably about, it was probably about three months. That was your question. It was three months to, yeah. to kind of really put it down. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. It's nice and quick. So looking yeah. at, um, so we were talking about post-apocalyptic nomadic warriors, and that is the ducking cover series, which is also a very mm -hmm. clever title. Um, the very first line in the back cover reads, even a mushroom cloud has a silver lining. <laughs> How long did it take you to come up with that line? It's brilliant. I um, I I couldn't say. I don't know. I want it. It was definitely one that I wanted. I wanted a hook for it, and um, I don't know if it just started that way or not. It just. You think it, it was it your marketing have. background? It could have been. What's interesting is we um we turned it into a sticker to sell with the books, and we have my wife and I do another thing. We do um. We have a business where we sell stickers and print art prints and stuff at cons. Awesome. Uh, we did it to kind of supplement the book table at cons, and now it's its own mm -hmm. table. But we had built this sticker for the books, and people just wanted just the sticker. So now they just <laughs> we we sell a ton of just that one sticker. It's just a bomb that says "Even a Mushroom Cloud Has a Silver Line," and the bomb's got like a smiling face on it with the tongue hanging out, stuff like that. So um, I would probably wear that on a t-shirt, no doubt. It, it's been it's it's a, it's a shirt as well. So we're uh -huh. yeah, it's it's been yeah. interesting. I was in the trying to merchandise your books a little bit. Um, that was one of the first ones that kind of stuck out. But um, I think I just got I got really lucky with that one. Well, I think you got so. really brilliant. I don't think there was any luck involved. Mm -hmm. um, so another series of yours is Dad Versus. So mm -hmm. I just that alone is funny. Um, so your dad <laughs> series. I'm wondering how autobiographical is it? Not at like, all. Do you have not, a beef not with a shred your of HOA? Truth. Oh, no, I love my neighbor who sits on the board who calls when my leaves fall in her yard. No, not at all. <laughs> There's no history there. No, that's my that's my wife's favorite of everything, probably because there is a little bit more honesty in there is sensible. <laughs> so a lot of the uh Sensible. there's yeah the there's dads versus zombies which is a novel and there was there was five short stories that preceded it and um it was more everyday stuff it was like dad versus the tooth fairy and a lot of that um there's there's a scene there where basically this this guy's younger son falls and kills a tooth you know so he's even losing it before he's really no one's been prepared to be the tooth fairy in the family yet so they're going through this together and they go to the dentist and the kid disables the x-ray machine in like three seconds. And that's my kid did that. I was like, don't let him like she handed him the film. Like, no, don't let him touch that. She's like, well, he can't break anything. He shoved it up in the x-ray machine. It was like, I told you, I warned you. I feel no remorse. I, I warned you he would break it. And sure, he disabled the whole the whole x-ray room <laughs> just like that. So so stuff like that. Definitely. Yeah, that that, that came out in that stuff. That sounds like therapy to me. It was very cathartic. Yeah, you're like, I'm going to write about very, this. I just... <laughs> yeah, a lot of it was very, very cathartic. So, uh, there, yeah, and the, 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 even the dads versus zombies, it's more about the... It's three rival dads that have to kind of work together to save their families, and they just they don't get along. They don't get along. And so um, there one guy goes on about um, running and how much he hates it. That's probably a little bit me. Uh, there's a rant that kind of got big. It was about um, the person that leaves half a donut in the work the box at work. Like they think they're leaving half a donut for somebody else, but no, they took half my donut, right? Like it's like no one else is going to touch that other half. You might yeah. as well take oh, it. Oh, you're being away. so kind. Exactly. You just wasted a whole donut. So. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. So, so the, the dads versus zombies may be more about the dads than it is about the zombies. But, uh, and that there's actually three follow up stories that I can't let those guys go. They're too much fun to write. They're just. Three bickering idiots. I love them. So. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, that explains it, though, because I was also wondering how book two seemed like the stories came before book one. So they did because it's a collection. Mm -hmm. That makes more sense yeah. now. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, and then looking at the Shattered Alliance and that one, the back cover copy, like it looks all serious. Mm. So, you know, it's it's quite I mean, serious shit is going down in this book. Um, and then the whole plot that, you know, the things the characters are going through, you're reading that going, wow, you know, he's totally gone off tone on this one. What's going on? And then as soon as you open it, it's completely irreverent. And I'm wondering, <laughs> how do you decide what direction to take the project when you start it? Um, I'm always going to be irreverent. I think that's kind of the brand at this point, for sure. I, I, um, I love playing with tropes in the genre. Yeah. Uh, my stuff's a parody as much as anything. My dad raised me on uh, Naked Gun and Police Squad and all the Zucker films. And um, 
so a lot of them kind of get that treatment that are just it's a little i stop a little shy of how zany they get so again so it's not so much physical i guess mm -hmm. um but uh that one i was uh it was during the pandemic when uh I just didn't feel like writing post-apocalyptic stuff at that time. Like, right. It's like, this there is was too no, real. There was no Charmin on the shelves. I was uh, like, this isn't, uh, I don't know. I, just, right I, I needed a break. So I took it into the future and outer space. And I just wanted to take the Star Trek utopia that Rodden, you know. Um, Roddenberry, had, yeah. Roddenberry, yeah, had uh, envisioned and then break it. That was my plan was like that that'll work you know it's like everyone has a plan till they get punched in the face that's kind of how that was to me so um but that it was a nice little it was escapism for me as much as it was anything else and i wrote all three of those during the the last the basically the, the year and a half when everything was locked down open locked down open whatever you know all back and forth when everything was uh much more questionable so mm -hmm. um but i love it and that's uh I, I throw a little bit of space opera uh, space Marines. The second book is very much like, uh, you know, military, space military, science fiction military. And uh, and then the third one is pure Swiss Family Robinson in space. It's um, uh, the one captain stranded on an alien world. Mm -hmm. um, he's crashed through no fault of his own, of course. Um, of he's crashed course. on this planet and has to has to get off. So, um, yeah, I just... Is it, it Shandor? It's, it, no, it's not Shandor. It's Altair. Um, but uh, thank God, because it's it's pretty much deserted. But there's a group of people there that he thinks are savage aliens, but they're actually um, it's not much of a spoiler. They, they've been they were an abandoned colony ship, so they were actually mm. from Earth. He's just too stupid to realize it. So, uh, <laughs> but they are being pursued by the the evil empire there. So it's uh, it's that was a lot of fun too. They're all kind of each each little book is kind of the the first one introduces several characters, then the follow up books are going to be kind of focused on. A couple handful of them or just one or something like that and then maybe they'll come back together as a as a group at some point but i just wanted i i, I didn't get into disc world until after someone told me like oh you remind me of you know your sense of humor reminds me of pratchett's I'm like well, i gotta read this and i just love the way he left himself open to do just anything mm -hmm. like he doesn't even have to take the same character from book to book i'm like i need that so that's what that mm -hmm. was really for me so i can kind of pick a, pick from any of these, these characters and have an adventure with them and uh Come back to the others when I want to. So I think it'll totally work because people are going to come back for your voice. So that's it's mm -hmm. just it's brilliant, which is exactly why we keep going back to Pratchett too. It's the same reason. So that's yeah. it's that works very well, I think, for for the way that you write. That's it's a good call. So you just made a big playground you can go play in it, which is what Pratchett did. It makes sense. Yeah, it's been very liberating. It's been it's been a lot of fun. So that's like really cool. yeah, it, each book can be its own, have its own theme, have its own tones, kind of like the Marvel mm -hmm. universe too, right? Like, well, this is a heist movie, this is a World War II movie, this is a, this is Dirty Dozen, this is you know that kind of stuff. So yeah, a lot of lot of lot of places to play now. So yeah, and Birdie says that uh, she loves your covers and your bookshelf. By the way, she likes your bookshelf. So oh, your covers you. <laughs> and you're indie published, right? So you have full control yep. over that. How did you decide like what color? What what was your inspiration for those? The 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 post apocalyptic covers um, have gone through a couple of iterations. Uh, it was the smiling bomb, the the laughing bomb, falling for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, but we needed we kind of uh, we marketed that for a while, humor first, and we kind of needed to really pull in the post apocalyptic audience. So there was a series of books called the Deathlands um, back. They were like uh, men's adventure. They did hundreds of them, I think. Uh, very Mac Boland kind of. Uh, pulp adventures like one book would come out a month from a different pen writer gotcha. and um the, the each cover was a boot stepping on a mutant scorpion or a snake or something like that and so we're like well what if we kind of pull this back into this and we had a, we had our guy stepping in gum just to kind of get that uh the, the humor aspect in it and those have been um that's that's the the print version, and we've moved on to kind of a a collage of characters now that are representative characters to kind of match the genre a little as it's as it's evolved. Um, the other stuff, uh, you know, um, we do the covers ourselves. My wife and I. She's an art director, so I was very fortunate. I've got that skill in the house, yeah. and uh, we've been able to kind of do that. Um, just we we wanted something that was really eye catching, and I will say uh, for anyone that's looking to write or is trying to. Just the last year, we started doing the conventions, and it has been really eye-opening as to what works, mm. how to sell, what gets instant attention. And of all the stuff I have on my table, that Dads vs. Zombies brings people over the most now. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, it's uh, it's just a pop of color or whatever, but it's also uh, clearly comedy. So it uh, and every little kid that walks by with their dad goes, Dad, you should buy that book. And I'm <laughs> like, like, yeah, he's dad. right. You yeah, should, dad, dad. You totally you should. You should. Yeah. <laughs> That's like you, dad. So, yeah. <laughs> Well, you do learn those things, right? I learned like my with my YA oh. fantasy. It's always dads with daughters because mm-hmm. there are so many daughters, especially if they're at a convention, they read fantasy. Yeah. So, you know, there it's a pop culture convention. You can almost guarantee it. And so you have the dad. The dad's like, what? You want a book? You don't want that skimpy outfit? Heck yeah, I'm going to buy you a book. How many right. do you want? They're our best customer. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so you're right. You've really got to figure out who your customers are and covers make a huge difference. It really does. So, it really does. It's it's funny how much it's communicating. But I just I found learn. that it's also looking at looking at humor and how it's been marketed in the past. It is mm-hmm. you look to Discworld and stuff like that, and, and uh, even Hyacinth and stuff like that. It's usually one big kind of cartoony graphic right in the middle. So um, those kind of work. Our our Junker series is definitely like that. We've got the Grim Reaper with a Gatling gun on one, and then a, a like a mechanical <laughs> bear on another. And yeah, um, is that bear? It's kind of creepy though that bear. <laughs> that whole one there, uh, that's that's my Rise of the Machine series. It's basically um, it, someone called it iRobot meets Ghostbusters. It's pretty apt. It's <laughs> like my theory is people in the future we will have machines that do things for us, and mm-hmm. there's a chance they will go on a murderous rampage. But there being people, is. that is a chance we're willing to take. Um, to make our lives know, easier, so, done. Shit, it's probably my neighbor, not me, that's going to get killed. So, it's, it's um, fine. but when I the always machine... say thank you to Alexa. It'll be fine. It just, I used to try and be nice. It's getting harder. Uh, <laughs> but uh, she's starting to cop a little attitude. Siri, too. Siri's got some lip on her now. I'm not liking it. Um, I'm not very but, nice to uh, Siri, sorry. Yeah. But in this series, the, so when your machine does go on a murderous rampage, these are kind of the, the mechanics down the street you call to stop it. And they have special weapons or whatever. And after the events of the first book, they're, they've, they've got a reality show and their ratings are failing. So they're dropped into this abandoned amusement park where all the animatronics have gone haywire so the bears aren't acting quite right there's a civil war going on at the hall of presidents that kind of thing so so my um, creepy vibe was correct it's kind of like all of our nightmares right like we want to go yay disney world so much fun but you just know those presidents are going to murder someone you just know it absolutely yeah Yeah. i I think taft was the the leader of the bad side of the presidents it was was petty and taft learn more about my presidents writing that book than i ever did in school (laughs) (laughs) so you you kept to the point where teddy and taff were friends right so Mm -hmm. that that's okay gotcha oh there was a huge falling out and that's where they're huge yeah yeah Uh yeah 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 Yeah. Yeah. history it's the most humorous thing ever it really is it really Mm. is no the really funny thing is the things that people think happened and then when you find out what really happened that's the funny part you're like oh that oh it's (laughs) way worse than you ever thought it was hold on oh yeah (laughs) don't go looking too deep yeah (laughs) Hold on, let me tell you. Um, and I noticed as I was reading through your books that it looks like most of them are written in third person omniscient. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm wondering why do you choose that particular POV? It's not often I, used today. I don't know. Um, part of me is just that's the way I thought. Well, I think part of the the, the comedy is going to come from the narration. So I think there's you, you almost need that narrator to be able to interject something kind of silly every now and then. Um, I've tried first person. Uh, I've written a book twice now in first person, and I haven't put it out there. And uh, I really do, I do enjoy it, mm-hmm. but it's just not my thing. I don't enjoy reading it. It's weird. I it, uh, outside of Butcher's Dresden Files, I, I haven't come and uh, Raymond Chandler's uh, books as well. I don't. I haven't come across too many first person reads that I like. I don't mind listening to it mm-hmm. on an audio book. I don't like mm-hmm. listening to third person audiobooks, but I like listening to first person audiobooks, and then vice versa in the reading. It's weird. Um, but uh, I, I don't know. It just, it, I guess it was just always in my mind that was the way a book should be written. And I think there was a lot of, when, I'm, when I first started writing, I think one of the things I, I know I was guilty of, um, and I don't think too much made it out there, was, was head jumping. And I think uh, I just needed to make sure I could go from character to character. Um, mm-hmm. So that was another reason I went. I went first, certainly for third person. We needed to see what the bad guys were up to because it's going to be silly, you know. Yeah, some but that was the third nonsense. person omniscient, right? That's why it was because yeah. third person. There's lots of stuff in third person, right? But the the omniscient sure. that was unique. But I agree. I think it completely works with the humor. Like mm-hmm. we talked about before the interview, it reminds me of Hitchhikers, right? It's got that same kind of voice because in order to get to the humor without making fun of the characters, right? There's a mm-hmm. difference that it's it's better to have a narrator outside of them. 
observing. And yes. so that that's what it, it felt like. But I didn't feel far away from them. It's just that that was how the humor was coming across. I think in some of the later books, I get a little closer to it. It, gotcha. it is closer, especially um, the last one I wrote was Alone on Altair. That's the one where the captain has um, crash landed on the planet. And we do see, uh, I believe, everything through his eyes. So it is a lot closer. It's still third person, but it's closer. Um, and that's that's where I started to go like, oh, wait a minute. Maybe a first person could really work because mm -hmm. I was having so much fun living inside his head. He's he's arrogant. He's brash and uh bit of a narcissist and he's so much fun to write um <laughs> he's not everybody's favorite character to read but he is so much fun to write um yeah. and the i need that break every once in a while too yeah the bad guys are easier because they're sure they're right so it's just it's a lot yeah. easier to write a character that is sure that they're right than it well, is people waffling there's been a couple where like uh one of the dads my mom just did not did not like him and she was like <laughs> i do not like this character and i was like okay let's see and i was writing zombies like how hate how much can i make her hate him and still and still redeem him at the end that was kind of my own personal challenge like <laughs> could i get her to absolutely despise him and come around and go and, I, and so when, when she finally read it i was like well, what'd you think of him at the end i liked him she was just <laughs> against my will <laughs> yeah he was fine <laughs> so i love it i love it yeah they're talking about the the dresden files on the Thing. And I agree that the Dresden Files is first person, right? Like you said. And a lot yeah. of urban fantasy is. So I think that's just a genre thing, right? Like urban fantasy really works in first person. So, yes. yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it was born of noir. And I think that's why the, 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 the Chandler did it well. And so does mm -hmm. Butcher. I think they, they're writing the same thing, just more yeah, Kim magic. Harrison, and, Kim Harrison rocks it. Yeah. it's. I mean, some of it's done really, really well. It's just never mm -hmm. been my favorite. And I, I, I'll, I'm, I'm probably going to try one in the future. Just, yeah. Yeah, you have to have a strong enough character that you have, mm -hmm. you know, like, again, like it's um, my stuff, too, is, is brief. My books are shorter mm -hmm. on purpose. I think there, there's a reason that comedies are 90 minutes long and not uh, and the ones that are two hours, not four annoyed, hours, not but, too yeah. <laughs> you can only stretch a joke so far kind of thing. So, um, you know, uh, sometimes I need to be able to jump back and forth from scene to scene and that doesn't work in first person. So, True. um yeah, it's kind of lim a little limiting that way, but I think it may, almost like a personal challenge. I think it can be done. I may, may try it in the future. That would be awesome. I can't wait to read it. Um, considering all of your worlds, so we've kind of gotten a, a brief glimpse at a few of them. Mm -hmm. um, which one would you spend a week in? Um, oh, man. Mm -hmm. None of them are nice. Uh <laughs> <laughs> The um, I think the Shattered Alliance stuff would be just fun because there's it's a million worlds, right? It's just a thousand mm -hmm. worlds and lots of places to go, lots of things to explore. And for the most part, everything works. It's just, um, yeah, I think that would probably be. Before or after the Alliance falls? Oh, after, I think. More I fun think that way. a little conflict. Yeah, more fun like that it. way. I like yeah. it. I like it. I mean, it's a week, right? It's like, I, it's just a week. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Be okay. <laughs> I don't have to be there that long, yeah. That's right, just a week, it'll be fine. Uh, is there anywhere you visited in real life that inspired a place in your novel? Uh, yeah, uh, especially the, the duck and cover adventure stuff, absolutely. Um, and I, well, okay, well, I'm actually from Canada originally, and I will admit that the, the second Shattered Alliance book, The Planet They're On, is Canada. Um, but uh, don't tell my family that. Like Pierce the, Anthony, uh, it's not Florida, I swear. Uh-huh, sure. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. <laughs> Oh, no, they just happen to have a content law, too. That's it. You know, just, yeah. Um, the uh, the Duck and Cover Adventures, I, I wrote that while I was working in downtown Dallas. I was sitting there in an office building looking outside, wanting to do terrible things to the city. So I did them in a book. Um, but that one has very much been inspired. I, the second one's actually based in Durango and Silverton, and I want to go there. And I've had a lot of people going like, oh, you nailed it. And like, I need to get out there. I really need to see that place. But it was mostly a lot of Google Maps and uh, – hmm. Uh, stuff like that. But um, uh, Niagara Falls uh, being, you know, driven through there a few times and everything. So one of the books takes place there. I thought that would be a fun, uh, a lot of wax museums in Niagara Falls. I had no idea until I started really digging into it and all the <laughs> kind of kitschy attractions and stuff were fun to play with. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. And then, uh, yeah, yeah, There's several of them. Tussauds, there's, there is, <laughs> and uh, there, I had a lot of fun in the wax museums with that book. But even there's, there was uh, the original, it's not SeaWorld, it's, uh, what was it called? Crap. 
I, it sounded like a pure knockoff. It was like Ocean Land. I mean, it's not it, but what's it called? Um, <laughs> it's they just grabbed a thesaurus and like just evaded the trademark. But actually, they were before SeaWorld. But um, like, so SeaWorld's the one who different... grabbed it. They they kind of did, yeah. Mm-hmm. But uh, you know, I spent there time as a kid there, and I had to I had to play with with that location too and stuff like that. And um, it was uh, yeah. It, there's a, there's a lot of stuff in the books that has been absolutely. And we just did um, we just got back from SpaCon up in Hot Springs, Arkansas, and I vacationed there a few times. And I'm like, oh, there's there's a book here. There's definitely a, this is a great setting because like the smaller towns I think are the ones that weren't destroyed, and that's where people kind of gravitated to. Um, so, uh, they're kind of fun to play with. And if you can make it something that a lot more people know, it's, it, it resonates. So, uh, there's definitely a story coming for the duck and cover series. that happens in hot springs. Absolutely. It's not that far away. So it totally works too. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. Uh, Friday blue wants to know which character would you have drinks with? Damien Stockwell. He is, uh, he is we my talked favorite about that one character. Yet. Yeah. I have the Bulletproof Adventures of Damien Stockwell. He's a mm-hmm. pulp adventurer from the 30s, 40s. Uh, he and his trusty valet, Bertrand, travel the world looking for evil to punch it in the face. That's what he does. And he is, again, he's a uh, no-filter, little arrogant, little brash, but, man, he is... Uh, he is the best to write. He is so much fun to write. Um, it goes back to that Clive Cussler roots, I'm going to guess, right? A, a little bit more. Uh-huh. He's more. Um, I love the Doc Savage books, the old Doc Savage novels, and he he's actually been hard to market because a lot of people don't remember Doc at this point. Like he's, I mean, he was written in the '30s, and um, but and also the uh, the shows I think had a big influence on on that character as well. A little bit of the shadow and stuff like that. So he's a he's definitely a pulp hero. And then uh, it's that mixed with the TV show Sledgehammer, if anyone remembers that. Um, just an arrogant narcissist cop it was uh it only ran for two seasons it was absolutely hilarious um it was uh <laughs> on purpose <laughs> yeah, uh no <laughs> no it was, <laughs> it, it was great the first season ended his his whole catchphrase was trust me i know what i'm doing and the end of the first season they'd been canceled so he, he's disarming a nuclear bomb and he says trust me i know what i'm doing and the bomb goes off that's how they ended the show and then over the summer, there was such a demand to bring it back. They renewed it for a second season. And like, well, how do we just blew up how do we L.A.? Fix the bomb? Yeah. <laughs> so everyone's like, how are the like? Well, the few of us that actually watched it, how are they going to do this? How are they going to do this? So the, sec- the second series starts with the the bomb going off, and then it says one year earlier, and they just back <laughs> it up a whole year, and just like it was like kind of a, a funny take on the the shower scene, but um, from Dallas. But uh, no, it was he was just like. Just ridiculously over the top. It was it was it was basically a giant parody of um, Dirty Harry, you know, just big yeah. gun and uh, all that. And uh, he big was funny gun, and that's, attitude, overconfident. Yeah, yeah. He talked to his gun. It was his best friend. Like it was just. <laughs> I'm telling you, it is it is a piece of history. It is it is wonderful. So it was kind of that attitude of the character mixed with kind of that pulp adventure and um, even a little bit of the, the TV show Tailspin. Like I mean, Adventures of the Gold Monkey, that kind of stuff. Um, I just I, the pulp. I, I love. There was a certain amount of ignorance that was just taken for granted. It was back when we were still writing stories that uh, hey, Mars has an atmosphere. Why not? You know, we didn't know any better, and it was like just these people and we that didn't were. Care. That, yeah, people that never left their living room writing about all these places all over the world. And there was certain like it was just forgivable because we didn't know any better. So there was a certain amount of liberty you could take there, too. But oddly enough, they are probably my best research books. They're not supposed to be, but I get into the weeds on that. And like the first one happens like there's uh, the, the the last third of the book happens on a banana plantation. And I got into the whole history of bananas in South America and Honduras. And there's a lot of just. Um, like you say, history is the most interesting part of it all, and it's uh, yeah. they, 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 it's really come out in those books because I'm writing in the, that era or whatever. It's uh, they end up becoming very well researched, and uh, and nobody reads them, but that's okay because they're for me. I love them. They're my they're my favorite, and uh, that's that's fine. <laughs> You gotta write what you love too. The, exactly. Um, I'm laughing. The the bananas. We there's a a ship down here, the tall ship Alyssa, um, in Houston. It's parked outside of Galveston. And so you get to go tour it and everything. And it's uh, it made a lot of money hauling bananas like that. It was just a huge thing. It was like it was like printing gold for them. So it just like they could go back and forth. I had no idea. So that's very funny. You mentioned that the things you have no idea, you know. Yeah. And if you like bananas, I wouldn't look into the history of them. 
You'll no, no, guilty. there's a lot of <laughs> no, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, the way we treat people, period, is not good. Yeah. But um, it was just I, I had no idea that it was a cash crop. You know what I mean? In that oh, way, yeah, yeah. so much so that they were able to, that's all they had to haul and they would make money. Um, yeah. So it was just, it was incredible. And they would lose like at least half the crop, right? Like I said, talked about all this stuff. So yeah. um, again, not the people stuff, but all this stuff. They talked about the spiders they brought back, the snakes they brought back, all the that they would bring <laughs> back. Um, so it was just, it's, it's fascinating. But yeah, I, I didn't mm. look into the people stuff because this was the touristy part where you read the walls. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And don't so. forget to get a chocolate dipped banana on the way out. That's Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Spider free. We promise mostly. It is Houston. We make no guarantees. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Uh, Channel Drop says pre moon landing sci fi is some of the best literature ever written. And I will accept no arguments otherwise. I love it. It was, they, there were no handcuffs. They, it was, I agree. I love it. I love the Bradbury <laughs> stuff. Like I love, yeah. 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 Mars no, is heaven. That's Come on. Yeah. That was great. <laughs> I think Venus is just rainy all the time. Sure, <laughs> why not? Let's just I mean, that. it is. Uh, it's yeah. just not water. So, I mean, <laughs> wasn't that far off. Yeah. Um, Let's see. So, I took some time to peruse your blog today. Yes, I've totally been stalking you. It's my job. Oh. I have to interview you, I swear. Um, so, you said that you almost always like listen to music. Do you listen to music when you write? I do. Yeah, I do mm -hmm. like listening to music when I write. Uh, it has to be lyric-free mostly. Uh, so yeah. I listen to classical, listen to soundtrack scores, um, a little bit of everything, really. Who's your um, favorite for soundtracks? For soundtracks? Um, I don't know. I usually just start with, uh, I, I got Spotify. I usually throw in the uh, um, uh, Sherlock Holmes soundtracks. So what's that? Uh, yes. Zimmerman? Nope. No, not Zimmerman. Um, it, well, do you mean the British one? No, the uh, the the Robert Downey Jr. Oh no, that uh, is movie. Zimmer yeah. Yeah, Zimmer Zimmerman. Zimmerman. Yeah, yeah. So Zimmer. I'll just throw that in and have it go from there. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, a lot of a lot of classical, a lot of stuff like that. It's just as uh, ambient noise kind of thing. But it does it does help. It does set the set the tone. Um, for some books, I've kind of gone through and found some stuff that'll help. The uh, the bears in that uh, the Junkers sequel uh, mm -hmm. are creepy. They have busted speakers, but the sound the Children's songs are still coming through. So there was a lot of Tom Waits, a lot of like creepy carnival music. I, I built a pretty creepy playlist. The, playlist the, the whole idea for those came from the um, Pink Elephants on Parade part from uh, Dumbo. That was nightmare I was fuel that as a kid. Too. Uh, it was. Yeah. Uh, it was that and we had, uh, and I was, I was telling my family like that and the teddy bears picnic used to freak me out. And they were like, what? No. And then they, I didn't realize that they didn't grow up listening to the Anne Murray version. The Anne Murray version of Teddy Bear's Picnic is haunting. So mm -hmm. um, that's where those guys came from. But yeah, so I built a list like that. But not I don't I don't often do that. It was kind of specifically for that one. Everything else is uh, instrumental, and because the lyrics otherwise, or um, or if I, I find some uh, uh, foreign music, like foreign language music, that works just as well. So. I highly recommend Audio Machine. Since you're on Spotify, look up Audio Machine, and they okay. have it's all instrumental. They very much sound like soundtracks. Um, they're oh. brilliant, and but each one they have like a different theme. Like one's about life, one's about space, one's about. So you can actually okay. go through and kind of just play that album, and it really sets the tone. There's highly one called uh, Epic Score that does the same mm -hmm. thing. They basically do needle drop music, and they mm -hmm. but they have like space opera. They have Rise mm -hmm. of the Machines. They have they themed it. And they've got like yeah. 40 or 50. They got a ton, but they are themed yeah. science fiction for that. So that is fun. That's pretty cool. Yeah. I like it too. I'm with you. Yeah. Um, when you're not writing, what do you do to relax? Um, do I not write? He's like, he's like relax. Uh, What's I, that? <laughs> I, I, I draw. Let's say the other thing we do oh, is um, cool. we, my wife and I do, um, we, we, we added some, I'm doing the cons. We people either read or they don't, and we wanted to stop people that were non-readers at the table. So we developed a line of characters that I draw called uh, Twisted Spirit Animals. So um, the idea is we we can't all be tigers, right? So we mm -hmm. made up. So uh, the kitten with the prison shank is our most popular one right now. <laughs> um, he's cute, cuddly, kind of stabby. Um, and we did, and and this became its own thing. So now when I'm not writing, I'm drawing animals. I just finished up. We did the hot spring show. So we did a razorback with a straight razor. That was one. Um, and then people, 
I had six people request a turtle that day, so I need to do a turtle sometime soon too. I think we have thirty now, <laughs> so that is uh, so cool. We do that as well, but it's, it still beats beats going to an office. So I'll I'll be drawing crazy animals. <laughs> the raven with an arson kit is frighteningly popular with teens. Um, that one know, might so be stuff too realistic, like though. I mean, it's a raven. We had uh, uh, this lady. She's uh, her her. She was at the booth across from us in Hot Springs, and her. She's like my spirit animal raven, and I used to be an arson detective for the fire department. So she was, she bought all those. It's just, it's, it's like, really this crazy. Is my new mascot. <laughs> There's some people walk up and they're like an otter with a tire iron. I've been seen, and they buy it and they love it, and it's great. It's 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 a lot of fun. It's writing the the books is I love it, and I could never stop. But mm-hmm. you know, I'm never going to see what the people thought of that joke on page 28. Like I'm not going to see that happen. Right. These I get to see people laugh and smile and have a a good time with the nonsense. So, so what, right now when I'm not writing, I'm I'm drawing another weird ass animal. <laughs> so, but well, Birdie says that she's that number too. seven for the turtle. So yes, there's definitely number seven demand for the turtle. For turtle. Yes. Okay, Birdie, I need to ask: Is it a sea turtle? Because okay. some of these people were very specific for sea turtle. Because I'd rather do an alligator snapping turtle. I think that would be a, a fun. Oh, one to do, that would so. be way more fun, especially considering what you've yeah. just done. Oh, a she tortoise. Says tortoise. Okay. Yeah, okay. she's she's totally no. She's like no tortoise. That would be fun too. Yeah. No, but I mean, especially you know down here in the south, uh, snapping turtles. I think that would definitely yeah. be the way to go. No doubt. So the monster they pulled out a couple weeks ago gave me nightmares. Like some guy pulled one out of a lake down there. It was like two hundred pounds or something. It was just like it, that's yeah, an eating turtle really right there, man. No, that's for yeah. Cool. Mm-hmm. It was crazy. <laughs> wow. Um, elderly deformed samurai tortoises. That's very, very specific. <laughs> it's very specific. The teenagers grew up. Yeah. That's right. That's right. It yeah. happens. Um, that's all right. We have two turtles in our D&D game that we do on Monday nights. We have two turtles, mm-hmm. and we asked for names for them, and they're named Jacob and Edward. So, you know, you <laughs> never know what's going to happen <laughs> with, with when you're playing. Yeah. <sighs> Um, the, uh, the stickers, do you sell them anywhere else or can they only get them at conventions? Uh, no, we sell them online too. We, we have an online store. That's, that's Dangerberry Industries. That's the, if you've, I don't know if you put up my, my uh, Twitch channel, that's also yep. our, 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 uh, our sticker shop and t-shirt shop and stuff like that. But at the shows we have art prints and everything now. It's really, it's really, which was nice because it helped me get over my imposter syndrome as being a writer. When I started signing my name on art prints, that was like, okay, now I'm really faking it. Like I, the books are okay, but this I'm conning everybody now when I sign a drawing I did. Um, but no one's complained so far. No, no, yeah. no. That sounds wonderful. I love it. Yeah. Um, what advice have you gotten that it has been helpful to your career? Um, man. You know, it's, it feels so long now. I'm trying to remember if there was any great stuff at the beginning. I think it's... Um, I don't know. I think the, the most recent thing where it, it was helpful was starting to do these conventions and I was starting to get onto panels and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And it's just um, uh, another writer told me, he's like, look, just get up there and show just any kind of personality at all. You know, most people don't expect a writer to have any kind of <laughs> personality. We're, we're all such introverts and we don't like right. leaving the house. If you can uh-huh. just like, he's like, don't freak out. Like if you show any kind of interest at all, you're you're good. They're <laughs> so, there like, for the you. Bar, That's... The bar, I think, the bar is a lot lower, is what he was trying to say than any than we than we think it is. And I mean that to a certain point. That's I mean, just it's just saying relax in your most nervous moments. But that's really once you can get past that. The the first time I was doing all that, I was freaking out, nervous. I don't like public speaking. I don't like sitting in front of a crowd. I don't like any of that. This the second time I got up there to do it, it was it's so much fun when you realize as the. Uh, the consequences of, and especially with like the humor too, the consequences of saying a bad joke or it doesn't go anywhere, you know, but if you don't get a good one out there, people are going to laugh. Like there's a bunch of stuff in my books that probably maybe people don't even know their jokes. And that's okay. It was worth a shot because every now and then there's one person that gets it and they'll that's write right. me an email and they like, Oh, I got this. Like, Oh, thank you. I didn't, that, that was just for me. You know, I'm but, glad it uh, hit for someone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but even in, in promoting and marketing and stuff like that, I know like sometimes I'm so hesitant to hit the the send button on Facebook or, or Reel or whatever. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't go anywhere. There's no – the consequence of doing it and not working are very low. But you've got to get out there because you know, the, the consequence of not doing anything is 
you don't sell books, you don't get known, you don't build an audience, you don't. And you got to go back to the office. Yeah, that that's the goal. We need to avoid. I, I do not want to go back to the office. <laughs> right. I never want to go back to the office. I yeah. will do all these things. Don't make me. Yeah. Yeah. Traffic in Dallas just as bad as Houston. Yeah. No, thank you. If oh yeah, if I can make an ass of myself to avoid going to the office, I will do it. That's fine. Done. That, that's that's, right. that's a better thing. Yeah, happily. Yeah. That's what happens yeah. when you're raised on all that humor. You see, you're like, yeah, no problem. Yeah. I'll make a fool of myself. No sweat. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yep. Yep. That's how they do it. Yep. I I agree. Houston is worse. I the agree. Houston is yeah, worse. Yeah, the no, Houston's I'm, definitely I'm worse traffic wise. Yeah, yeah. 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 I agree too. Yeah. Even lunchtime. Don't leave your house. Just just wait. Yeah. Um. Let's see. All right. So we have made it to the lightning round. Yay. These are the very important questions. These are the ones the audience, they place bets on them. So here we go. What is your favorite flavor of ice cream? Um, Chocolate chip cookie dough. Oh, I like it. Good choice. Mm. Can zombies climb? Zombies can climb only on the backs of each other. Like, I don't think they can work a ladder, but they can walk up a pile of other zombies. All right. So all right. Climbing or is that scampering? I don't know. I mean, at being writers, probably scampering. But per the audience, they're going to have to make their decisions on that one. Mm. Um, what is your favorite fast food restaurant? Yeah, I'm going to go with Whataburger. Good choice. I think being yeah. a Texan, we're not allowed to choose anything else. It's just and always there. Have you seen? Just... <laughs> have you seen? Uh, what's <laughs> oh crap! It just came out. It's a great movie. Whataburger's in it, and and I've totally ruined it. <laughs> <laughs> no, you haven't. But the funny part is for that, it's 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 24 hours, right? Yeah. And yeah. Somebody well, even Vengeance. Put... Ven- the movie Vengeance. Gotcha. Waterburger right. plays a huge role in it, and it's it's wonderful. Yeah. So. Huh. We'll have to look at it. And it is. It's always right there. It's it's whenever you need it. It's it's mm-hmm. open for you. So. Yeah. After band practice, man, that was it was Waterburger. It was the only place open that could handle us. <laughs> yeah. Um, beer, liquor, or wine? Uh, liquor, whiskey. Yeah. Good choice. Yeah. And finally, where can fans find you and your work? Uh, you can find me on Amazon, on Audible. Uh, Ryan's mentioning uh, Bobby Adair. Oh, it's that's uh, Weeb Glide. He was just reading Slow Burn. Uh, I have the same narrator that does uh, Bobby's Slow Burn. Does a lot of my work as well. Um, but I'm in Audible. I'm on Amazon, uh, print and ebook. Obviously, uh, you can find me at Benjamin Wallace Books. Um, that's my website. I'm on Facebook, and then uh, even the thedangerbearindustries.com is where you can find my stickers and all that nonsense. And then on Twitch, we do a billion bad ideas. As our, as our podcast, we do it on uh, Danger Bear Industries on Twitch. So, and that's it. myself and uh, Clayton Smith and Stephen Luna are another couple of other authors that uh, we do that together. So, and we have a lot of fun. I think we're supposed to talk about villains tomorrow. That's our, uh, that's our plan. Yeah. So well, that sounds like a good idea, not a bad idea at all. Right. Excellent, excellent. So now that Ben is your favorite writer, please make sure to review his work. You can also review us wherever it is you get your podcast. You can also subscribe on YouTube, uh, cursedragonship.com slash YouTube. And you can follow us on twitch.tv slash cursedragonship. And we'll catch you next week, uh, next Tuesday, 8 p.m. Central, on Twitch Live with William. What do I have here? Uh, William Joseph Roberts is next week. So that'll be fun. Hillbilly, we call him. (laughs) 